check, check, check. Check, check, check. You can check the check the thing and make sure if it's not written the way I just told you. Yeah, I'll check it later. All right, check it later. Oh, okay. But no, but we're gonna start now. Okay, it is recording. All right, here we go. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, I'm gonna give you guys a number of definitions. Uh, in today's class, uh, there, there are some definitions for a number of terms that we've been talking about up to today, uh, and I've been mentioning that I'll give you these definitions, but I don't want you to focus on writing down the definitions, because what I want you to be focused on, of course, is what I say about them and our discussion about them. So that's what you should be taking notes on, as opposed to focusing on the way it's written on the screen. If you can write it down real fast, go ahead. But let me tell you this thing, which is true of all of us, including me. I haven't escaped this. 
but I try. All the time, when you think, when you're listening to something, I don't know what it is, maybe somebody who studied, any psychology majors here? Hands all the way up, let me see. One, two, three, four, okay, there's a few. Um, so if you guys ever uh, come across this in the literature, let me know um, what it is. But it's an observation I've made, which definitely exists in the psychology literature, related to attention. Um, we all think that we are capable of listening to or concentrating on more than one thing at a time. Scientific studies show that shit ain't true. It's another example of false consciousness. It's something that we all seem to believe. Perhaps it's rooted in evolutionary biology. I don't, surprise, surprise, happen to have my own theory on this. I just know that it's true. And what it is is that I'm talking to you, or you're talking to me, we're in a conversation, I'm listening, and I think that at the same time, I can go on my computer, and go to this file, and pull up this document that relates to the thing that you're telling me. Now, what's actually happening at that time, when I say, just like you, I'm telling you about me, and this is all, I'm talking shit about you at the same time, same damn time. Here's what I'm telling you. You're talking to me, I'm listening to you, I'm actually interested in what you're saying. This is much more egregious when I'm not interested in what you're saying, which sometimes is the case. But when I, even when I am interested in what you're saying, and I might be trying to pull up a document or some notes that I had that relate to what you're talking about. You know, it's like what I wanted to say about the thing you're talking about. I imagine my false consciousness is that I'm listening to you, and at the same time, I'm performing this other task. In reality, what I'm doing is I'm switching back and forth. I'm listening to you, I'm looking at the thing about that. I'm listening to you, I'm yeah. So I'm switching back and forth. My attention is going from one to the other, but it feels to me, because I'm not, I'm not consciously choosing that switching. That's sort of just my habit. So I don't realize when I'm not listening to you and when I am, right? And here's when I realize it. I realize it when you then ask me a question which I should be able to answer, but I can't answer it because I wasn't listening even though I thought I was listening. And then you say, you weren't listening. And I say, yes, I was. I was listening. And then I become indignant because I know I was listening. And then you're like, yeah, but obviously you would have been able to answer this question. And then I'm all upset because I think that you weren't listening is a claim about my intentions, right? Yeah, but I intended to listen. So shouldn't that count? But no, it doesn't fucking count because there's such a thing as objective reality. And in objective reality, as much as I intended to listen, the facts show that I was not listening, right? It doesn't matter that my memory of listening is that my memory was that I committed to listening and I was listening and then something happened. I don't know what happened, right? Now, hands up if this has never happened to you and this totally doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to you? It does. Okay. All right. So, hands up if what I just said, somebody has to raise their hand here. I shouldn't say has to. I expect somebody to raise, I'm glad nobody raised their hand in that last question. I'll be shocked and dismayed, maybe that's an overstatement, if uh, nobody raised their hand to this. How many people who, I just said that, I just said what I said, gave you this little tidbit about psychology. How many people who already knew that and think that that's obvious and they are already very attentive to that and they do their best to avoid doing that thing? Put your hand all the way up. Okay, so then, so that looks like a majority to me. Would you say majority? Okay, so hands up if you, if you did not say yes to that question. So, and, I, and I'm going to rephrase the question, make sure I'm saying it the same way. Uh, hands up if I, what I said just now sounded like, okay, you may have understood part of that, but you don't, didn't really understand that we're never really multitasking, we're always really switching back and forth, we don't really understand when our attention goes out. Hands up if you think that there was something insightful that you took from me saying that. 
Hands all the way up. Okay, interesting. It's a minority. Okay. Let's move on. Skip this. Uh, well, no, 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 don't skip it. Don't skip it. This is, I have this as a reminder, but I don't know that I've ever said this, so this, technically it's not a reminder, is it? See it. Okay, read this. Have I shared this with you guys already? It wasn't on a syllabus? Well, Dan, let's put this, let's put this on a syllabus. I'm going to leave it up there, just make sure not everybody reads the same speed. Any questions about this slide? It's all self-explanatory? I'm going to take it as it is all self-explanatory. OK. I can do you know, a whole class or a couple classes on this topic, but uh, unfortunately, I can't right now. Let's move on. All right, race versus ethnicity. And this other thing, these are the key concepts. Shocking. All right, so I've been talking, I've been using these terms uh, throughout the lecture, throughout the class. We're in week six now. And uh, never did I define these, th uh, maybe I defined race. Did I define race for you guys? OK. But I didn't define ethnicity. I did tell you it was a, uh, these are distinct things. I did give you my conspiracy theory as to why um, they're often confused in your mind and in uh, general discourse. I do mean conspiracy theory facetiously as a joke, but a joke about something which is funny because it's so true. Um, culture, I haven't defined either. But yet, Tell me if I'm wrong. Nobody, maybe when I said, I, I think when I said, race and ethnicity are not the same thing. I imagine for a, a, a good amount of people in the room, you're like, wait, what do you mean, why? Or else you're just aware that um, it would be difficult for you to, to clearly state what the distinction is, even if you do tend to think that there is a distinction. I'm guessing that's a good number of people. What I what I want, I want to hear from you, if this is not the case, um, I think that I've been using the word culture this whole six weeks, this five weeks, and I don't think anybody had the same thought in their head. I don't think anybody uh, was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, Professor D, what do you mean culture? What do you mean by culture? How, do you, how are you defining culture? Right? I think that this is a word, just like race, just like if it wasn't, if it wasn't a central thing, issue to do with social justice, and therefore, we're ta I'm talking about race, I'm defining race, I'm telling you that the way we understand it in society, you know, so I've been focusing on that a lot. But had I not been doing that, if I was just casually using racial terms, and oh, I didn't, we didn't have the Caucasian discussion here, did we? Uh, mm, mm, mm. Okay, um, so uh, if I wasn't using, you know, if I was just casually talking about race, in the way that you're all accustomed to it being talked about. I don't think you'd be asking these questions. You wouldn't be wondering, what do I mean and how am I defining it? Because we are used to using words in ways that we assume we're all using it in the same way, assuming we're all understanding it in the same way. Right? So, but as you've heard me say, and you've taken notes on, hopefully, and you're ready to answer questions about it on the exam, um, I'm suggesting to you this is not the case. I'm suggesting to you that we are often uh, using words in ways that, you know, we don't understand that the person we're talking to or the people we're talking to are understanding the words in a different way, maybe because they come from a different cultural background um, or just for whatever reason, their, their upbringing or their perspective is different, and so there's these different assumptions. And therefore, when you're in a discussion with somebody like that, what happens is 
that's called talking at cross purposes. You're having a discussion, you think you're talking about a subject, you think you are understanding these words in the same way, but you're not understanding them the same way, and therefore you misidentify where your disagreement actually is. Um, so that's this broader lesson I'm trying to give you. For today, I want to give you a concise, precise, analytical way of understanding these terms. And the reason I want to give that to you, you know, maybe I've already given you the reasons throughout class. If not, let's you know, uh, do it in uh, our discussion. And we try to do, I really like to do discussion the way that we've been doing it. I'm hoping that everybody in the class has been feeling like, even though it's a challenge in a class this big, to, um, to learn discursively, dialectically, in the cipher we all learn from each other. I like how that's been going. Um, I'm hoping that people are also feeling that. Um, the drawback is that some of the things which I'm really trying to, which I really think are valuable for you guys to have, some of this intellectual ammunition, you know, we got to make sure it doesn't get sidelined. So let's go, let's go to it. So therefore, raise your hand if you have any questions as I'm going through this. But for the most part, I'm going to try to bang out these slides and then have the discussion afterwards. Next slide. I'll give you a second to read this. I'm going to share, remember, I'm going to share all these slides with you. So if you want to take a note, make, take it as a point form thing. Um, but you don't got to write down the slide, because the citation, the slide, I'm going to give it to you. Uh, have I assigned, as required listening, have I assigned any songs by KRS-One? Boogie Down Productions? So I didn't clearly hear everybody say yes or no. What that indicates to me, it could, there could be various reasons for that. But let me make sure it's not because you don't know the exact names of the artists who have been on the required listening or viewing list. If you don't know the names, and therefore you're unsure, you're not going to do good on this exam. All right? Boogie Down Productions is the name of the group that KRS-One founded um, and that he was a part of. And so the first couple albums that he raps on are by the group Boogie Down Productions. And then afterwards, after uh, 1992, he started releasing albums just as KRS-One. So my question was, in the required listening or viewing, I'm just going to say listening, I understand it could be viewing or listening, did I assign any songs by his group or by him? It was under recommended, yeah, but not in the required. Oh, but, and, but did I show any in class? What did I show? Huh? Anybody remember? Okay, yeah. I showed, so in one of the early lectures, I showed these, a slide that had two albums. It was, the, um, it was Public Enemy's second album, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, which is the album that has Black Steel and the Hour Chaos on it, which was one of your required viewing and listening things. And then on that same slide, I also showed the cover of Boogie Down Productions' second album. And the reason, the point of that slide, and what's relevant for you to have taken notes on from that slide, is that there was also a quote on that slide from KRS-One, who said, these two albums set off consciousness in rap. So very often, we talk about conscious hip hop. These two albums from 1988, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back by Public Enemy, and by all means necessary by KRS-One, these are the paradigm examples, the paradigm albums of conscious hip hop. They're not the only ones. You could debate if, you know, you don't have to like them. It may not be your favorite conscious rap album from that period, but these are very, but these are the examples. Like if you study, if you study this stuff and you haven't studied these albums, you haven't studied this stuff, would be my claim, right? Um, anybody know uh, the, the title of the Boogie Down Productions album I just gave you, By All Means Necessary? Anybody know where that title com comes from? Well, hold on. 
Let me see if there's anybody else. Hands up. Anybody Anybody know? All right, bring, bring it down. By all means necessary. Who said, who said by all means necessary for $20? Okay, all right. By all means, yeah. Yeah, say, that's, that's the reference. Did somebody else say that? Yeah, but you didn't hit the buzzer in time. Um, yeah, that's right. And also the album cover... Uh, it would be cool if we could just pull that up, but we, we don't have it right here. But, but the album cover to the Boogie Down Productions, to this album, by all means necessary, is a reference. It's an intertextual reference to Malcolm X. So not only did Boogie Down Productions um, represent Malcolm X, represent the continuity, this is the actual point for the class, represent the generational continuity of black radicalism, not only by naming the album, by interpolating one of the most famous quotes by Malcolm X, but they also did so with the album cover. The album cover is a picture of KRS-One looking out the window holding back a curtain with an Uzi, like that. He's looking out, you know, holding his Uzi. Everybody know what an Uzi is? An Uzi is a submachine gun. Um, and that's a reference to a very famous picture of Malcolm X, where Malcolm is looking out the window in exactly the same posture, um, holding a rifle, right? So what has been updated is the outfit. KRS-One is dressed differently. And the weapon that he has is a modern weapon of that time. And so what is being said? What is the message there? Anybody? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Changing same, right? That there is continuity in the conditions of, you know, however you want to name it, right? The black struggle in America. Um, or, or broader. Um, yeah, you going to ask something? Right. Right, 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 right. Which is, and now why is that, is that, I mean, is that obvious? Why is that, why is there, why is that even something to be said? Why is that, why is that a message? It's a message because that fact, which Karis one believes is a fact, Boogie Down Production believes is a fact in 1988. He might believe it's a fact uh, based on this quote uh, from this year. You might get the impression Karis one believes this is a fact today, even though that album cover is from 88, right? But why is this relevant to say? Why is it relevant to make a piece of art about it when art is about beauty and truth and justice, according to Dubois? It's because mainstream knowledge, mainstream depictions of knowledge, claims of knowledge, deny this fact. Right? In every, in the hegemonic, in the mainstream, in the dominant narrative, about conditions in the United States with respect to social justice on any axes of social justice you name, whether we're talking about racial oppression, sexism, um, any number of uh, class antagonism, class oppression, the mainstream discourse, the dominant narrative is always even if it's, okay, things are bad, oh, we, there's a bad example, here's this, this negative event that happened, the mainstream depiction is, but it's not as bad as it used to be. It ain't like it was in the, you fill in the blanks. Right? That's the mainstream depiction. Um, and that's why, and that's why artists like, that's why hip-hop artists and any artist who is, challenging this narrative with their visuals as well as their al with their album covers and rhymes and whatever, they're challenging this because it's a challenge to mainstream knowledge. 
All right? So we have this definition here from KRS-One about race. Race is a white colonial class distinction. It is the way in which invaders and colonizers organized and identified their captured and enslaved populations. This is from this book that he's working on called Black Oustery, which is a play on history, a philosophical look on black and history. This other definition here, have you seen this before? My definition? Okay. So most people have not seen this before. I haven't shown this in class. I haven't said it in class. I've mentioned it. Okay, cool. But it's not in your required readings, and I haven't put it up on a slide. So I'm going to give this definition to you. This is, these are definitions that are test-worthy. Um, races are colonial subjectivities reified as inherent identities. Between these two definitions, which one is more clear? First or second? You can just shout it out. No, it's not a clear answer. OK. Put your hand up if you think the first one is clearer, like you understand it better. Hand all the way up. OK. Put your hand all the way up if you think the second one is clearer. You understand that one better. OK, it's a minority. Keep your hands up. People say this one's clearer. What's your name? Yeah. Microphone uh, to Aaron. Uh, Aaron, uh, I want you, given that you have a minority opinion here, um, I'm interested to know why you find the second definition more clear than the first. Well, for me, it's kind of just like the simplistic language used. Um, In the second definition? Yeah. Well, I mean, for the most part, and it's very short and just right to the point, uh -huh. it's talking about there's different subjective like identities yeah. and the way that people are grouped into those is what we, what we call race. OK, cool. Yeah. Uh, who else had your hand up saying the second definition more clear? Michael? Thanks, Aaron. I like the second one better because I just think it's like more condensed. Uh huh. I th I think it's stating a very very similar idea. Yeah. Like almost, it 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 almost feels like the first one is a more verbose way of saying the second one, and so I just like the second one because even though they're the same idea, the second one is shorter, like short and sweet, more to the point. Cool. Thank you for that point. Um, who else had their hand up? OK, uh, right over here. This will be, oh, uh, sorry, here and then here. Um, so let, let's summarize. Let, let me just summarize one thing that um, Aaron and Michael both said. So they both commented on the fact that the second one is more concise. Let's agree. The second one is more concise. Um, and I think also what they're getting at is the second one is more analytically precise, I think maybe I got that from where both of you guys were headed. Verbose, that's an interesting, you know, it depends on how verbose is defined, which one is more verbose. Um, but, I, but, I, but I agree with those points that you guys have raised. What do you want to add? Um, I just wanted to say um, the first one, the, the first line, race is a white colonial class distinction, kind of just make, is kind of equates to what your uh, definition is right. in the sense the first one has a semicolon and it's just explaining the first sentence. Yeah. Okay. So and yeah. So yeah. So why does that mean that the second one is more clear? So white colonial class distinction. I mean, it could mean many things. Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. And the second one. It's not it so, just, so the the first one. It's more words, yeah. but it's not as resolute. It's not exactly. as analytically precise. Yeah. Okay. And then you also add on inherent identities. Yeah. So that's a added on statement from a phrase from the first one. OK. Um, all right. Uh, Ebony, grab the mic, pass it over here. You, you agree with those points. Yeah, OK. No, that's cool. That's cool. It's the same points. Uh, uh, pass it to this guy here. 
Okay, so real interesting. I want to keep moving because I want to get to these other things. I'd love to hear what the rest of you are whispering about. Let me guess at it, and then when we come, we will do a discussion today. So if you have an impo- a point that you want to raise, just mark it down so you can remember. We can come back to the slide if you want. We can talk about it. Um, so here's a distinct. So also, what I didn't, uh, I think, a commonality in the uh, in the points that you guys raised was wasn't just that it was concise, but it was more analytically precise. But ultimately, you said you guys seem to say they're more or less saying the same thing. These are not contradictory definitions. These are, these are not alternative definitions from what you see. They're the same definition expressed differently, right? Um, and uh, if, you, if you disagree with that, bring it up during discussion. I agree with that. Um, and, but I agree with the majority of people in class that for the majority in class, this might be tautological, the first definition seems more clear. I think for most people, this would seem more clear, and the first one, and it's precisely because there's less um, academic language, right? There's the words that are being used in the first ex- description are more familiar words in, in uh, lay discourse, in common discourse, right? Subjectivities, we don't say that in, in our general conversations every day, right? That's academic language. Uh, reified, I don't know how many people know what reified means. Um, we don't say it in our regular conversations. You say that when you go to university and then you start learning this university language, right? You go to the hood, or if you're from the hood, you have some, some aspects of language you learn there. You come here, which is a different hood. It's a you know, hood neighborhood, it's a neighborhood, university neighborhood, right? <laughs> It's a neighborhood. You learn, there's, there's, there's language, right? You learn to code switch. But not all of us are familiar with this. So it, even if you know, even if you've heard these words by being around academics or reading this ac- uh, you know, academic stuff, it's not second nature for you to use these words. Um, if that's the case for you, then the second one, well, it's, it has less words. Um, it may not be as clear. So let me tell you what these words are. Subjectivities, I'll just give a a real quick stab at it, just to be clear. And yet, okay, so now, and here's another thing. When people, I've just said to you, these are academic terms. Most of the time, say if you watch, I don't know if uh, any of you guys like, you know, you enjoy watching Fox News, let's say. On Fox News, they may also reference uh, this same thing that, I, that I've just referenced, which is that academics, you know, they have their way of talking, they have their language, they have their terms. Um, when you encounter that comment about the use of academic words, another expression for this is jargon, right? So there's academic jargon. There's jargon that is specific to certain disciplines. All you guys are uh, in university studying different things. There is a jargon associated with your particular field. Okay? Now, sometimes jargon is spoken of in a very pejorative way. I'm suggesting that more often than not, if it's referenced on Fox News, it's going to be in a demeaning kind of way. Right? And there is a truth to that. All right? It is true that there are inappropriate times that people use jargon that is intentionally obfuscating, that is designed to hide the truth, that is designed to make them sound like they know what they're talking about when they don't know what the you know what they're... I don't want to swear. Um, Right? That wouldn't be appropriate language for if I was going to perform you know, professorialness. Um, appropriate language is subjectivities and inherent and, uh, yeah, and reified, right? That's appropriate for me, the language for me to use in this kind of a class. But you might be surprised to know that I'm not using these words to make myself sound intelligent. I'm not using these words because 
I want to be accepted in the academic community. And I want, I want people to, you know, and I want to hide the fact that I really don't think, I, deep down inside, I think, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, right? I happen to think I know what the fuck I'm talking about. Maybe, maybe you agree, maybe not. But um, I'm using these words because jargon exists for a good reason in each of these fields. It's because it allows us to name precise ideas, right, in a, in a clear way and to analytically distinguish things which, if we're to use general language, takes us more words and more time to draw the distinction between. And that's because, as you all know, as you all have familiarity with, we use lots, there are, there are many words in our vocabulary that we use to mean different things. And we don't specify which meaning we're using, we just leave it up to the context, right? And we imagine that the context is clear, and then if somebody suggests to us that our use of the word is not clear, um, and then they say, well, technically the word doesn't mean that, or I thought you meant this, you know, then we get angry at them because we say, well, you know what I meant, right? Sometimes I did, but sometimes I'm trying to give you a hard time. But other times, you are assuming, right, that, the, that one's specific legitimate usage is obvious by, based on the context, but that's a bad assumption, right? So this is why I'm using this language. I could, I could substitute different words in here. I could say, instead of saying races are colonial subjectivities reified as inherent identities, what I mean to say is what KRS-One means to say. All right, I'm saying the same thing. But I'm being more analytically precise for exactly the reasons that you guys brought up. Because you say, white colonial class distinction, well, that's the contingent, understanding this in the same way as KRS-One means it, or, or, or the four of you guys read this and say, yeah, I understand it, but what are the assumptions you're making? The assumption is that all four of you understand the word white to mean the same thing, you understand colonial to mean the same thing, you understand class to mean the same thing, and class distinction to mean the same thing, right? And some of you are thinking about it as white, comma, colonial, comma, and class distinction, whereas others of you are reading it as white colonial class as adjectives that apply to distinction. So there are so many levels of possible misunderstanding that none of you recognized when you first read it and you said, yeah, that's obvious, right? There's lots of ways to understand this to mean very different things. Now, is that true with my definition? Sure, but less so, right? Because these are not just general words that we're used to throwing around, we are more careful and precise with the meaning of the individual words. Still, we can still have different interpretation, blah, 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 but that's the purpose of writing it this way, all right? So now you understand the difference between appropriate and inappropriate use of jargon. I could say races are colonial identities. I could replace subjectivities with identities, right? Races are colonial identities, and instead of reified, I could say represented as inherent identities. Let's just say, I, I, my temptation right now is to give you a whole bunch of synonyms that I could say. I'm not going to give you a, a whole bunch of synonyms. I'm going to give you an example of why giving that particular substitution it's not doesn't mean exactly the same thing. Okay? So I can state this in language that you are more familiar with, that people on the street are more familiar with. I could say, if I say races are colonial subjectivities, reified as inherent identity, somebody looks at me like, what the fuck are you talking about? Right? If that happens, or I anticipate that's happening, or, or I'm afraid that they're going to give me that look because I'm insecure about people looking at me in a certain way, you know, um, then uh, I, I just want to get along, I just want to fit in. So maybe I won't even say it that way the first time. But, even if, but if I do, 
And then they give me this look. Maybe I'd be like, oh, shit, let me, uh, no, 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 no. I'm not one of those people. Check it out. I could say, races are colonial identities, right? You know what identity is. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to, like, you know, be more complicated than I have to be. Races are colonial identities represented as inherent identities. That's simple. That, that's the gist of what I'm trying to say, right? It's colonial distinctions, right? Colonization happened. Enslavement, the transatlantic slave trade occurred. And it created positions of superordination for some people, created positions of privilege. I mean, even I'm talking basic language, right? Created uh, positions of privilege for some people and deprived people of the very basic necessities of life for many other people, right? That's colonial, those are the colonial identities, colonized colonizer, right? You guys don't find those complicated identities. You all feel like you know exactly what a colonizer is and a colonized is. You probably all know by now, and if you don't, I challenge you, come see me in office hours and tell me that, Professor D, there's nothing you can tell me about the identities of the colonized and colonizer that I don't already know. I understand those concepts perfectly. I don't need to look it up. I don't need a deeper understanding because that shit is obvious, right? And then see if you can answer my questions about it. I guarantee this will be one of many examples of terms that you just think you know, and I can prove to you, you don't. But I just undermined my whole point, because my point was that if I say races are colonial identities represented as inherent identities, you understand that. And you do understand the gist. You do understand the point I'm trying to make. But there is a nuanced difference between identities and subjectivities. Because your identity, I'm not even going to go into it. It doesn't matter. The point is that there is a distinction. Reified, OK? Reified doesn't mean represented as. It means something similar to. In this context, you can substitute reified for represented as and get a close enough understanding. But in another sentence, you substitute represented, you, su you take out reified, you put in represented as, you're not going to get the real meaning. Okay? So that's why I'm using terminology like this. And, that's, and the reason why I spent as much time as I did talking about this is not because I just can't stop going on every possible tangent that I think of. Don't tell them. Don't expose me. Um, that's not why. It's because I want you to not walk out of here the way the, there's a risk that I think that applies to a lot of you here. The risk that I'm trying to negate, that I'm trying to mitigate, is that you're going to write this down. You're going to be like, yeah, OK, whatever. You're going to learn it for the exam. But you will continue, go about living your life as if race is just defined the way you were always thinking about. As if this is just this language here, I'm putting it on the board, you know, and the purpose of that is for you to pass a multiple choice test. All right? It's not the fucking reason. The reason is because you don't know what the fuck this shit is. And I am writing it in this way, and KRS One is breaking it down for you in this way, because you don't know the shit you think you know. What you do know is that you don't like racism. What you do know is that you want to take it to the enemy. And you want to change the conditions. You want to combat racism. But if you don't understand what race actually is, and how it operates, and what racism is, and how it operates, then you are going to fail. And that's the test that I want you to pass. I don't give a fuck about the multiple choice test. I want you to pass this test. All right? 
That's why. So I'm specifying these subjectivity. And I'm writing it this way, and exactly those of you who said you found it more clear, right? Minority. That's why I'm giving you this language, right? You guys are familiar with philosophical formulations, academic formulations, so therefore it was more transparent to you. Most people are more familiar with co more common language that we all grew up speaking, right? Which, that's, of course, that's also true of you guys, but you've had more experience dealing with formulations like this, right? So for the majority of people in class, I'm showing you that the reason I'm formulating it this way, right, is so that you can learn to have this analytical precision so you can see through the lies when people are talking all kinds of shit, they got words going everywhere, it's a word salad, right? You think you agree with them, you're not sure, you want to clarify something for them, they, keep, they throw at you more word salads. You've got to be able to hear through all that and know what they're really saying. Because a lot of people are going to represent themselves to you as if they agree with you. And one way they're going to do that is by not being analytically precise. You're going to go into a meeting with them, with the administration, or with the uh, ex board of executives, or with whoever you're going into a meeting with, you want, you want to get them to change something, and they're going to throw all kinds of language at you designed to placate you, designed to make you feel like they are on board with the general idea of what you're trying to say. But if you can't then condense what they're saying into clear analytical A and B distinctions, then they're going to pull the wool over your eyes. Let's go to the next slide. All right. Remember, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you these slides. If I don't give them to you, you could email Cess and say, Cess, Professor D said he's going to give us the slides. Can you please post the slides? And Cess is much more responsive than me. And, and maybe she'll post the slides for you. Is that what would happen, Cess? Or would you be like, nah, I'll talk to Professor D? We don't know. You try both of us and see which one of us does it. But, the, but these slides are available for you. Um, race does not equal ethnicity. Both are social constructs. Who knows what that, those three dots mean? Therefore, both are social constructs. Therefore, they are inherently political. All right? Now, by now in class, if you've learned all the lessons I've been teaching you, that's a, that therefore is a straightforward derivation. But if you haven't, but if you've just heard the words and taken some notes, and you haven't understood the definition of politics that I've given you, and the definition of social construction as I've been discussing it, then that derivation, by derivation I mean the therefore, it follows that. If that's not obvious to you, that means that you haven't conceptually understood what I've been trying to teach you up to this point. So if you're in that camp, I'll try to, yeah. Uh, Dan, Mike. So I said, so I said both race. So here's a similar. I'm gonna come to you in one second. So what we're saying here, this is a slide aiming to distinguish, analytically distinguish race and ethnicity because you all know that we're commonly we all the time we hear people conflating these things. So I'm trying to show you what's similar, what's different. Starting with a similarity. Both are social constructs. And now, this little digression, but important for you to understand, is if something is a social construct, it's inherently political. What's your question? Yeah, so that was sort of my question. Um, I forgot to ask this when we were like defining social constructs. And I was kind of wondering, like, um, like I understand like you're like drawing a divide between groups but is that like necessarily like hierarchical like cuz if it's not then it doesn't have to be about power you know cuz if there's two groups that are neutral yeah then excellent question tell me yeah. again joe joe keep the mic for one second joe um this is actually somebody else uh came to me after class the day that I gave you the slides on defining politics and power um, and, uh, and asked me a question, which is a very common confusion 
with these definitions. And I, from, and I was like, oh yeah, I should mention that in class, and I didn't. So Joe, thank you for bringing this up, because it's related. So um, the question you just asked is so important for people to understand. OK? Question is, so this is based on you are, obviously, you remember my definition of politics. And my definition of politics, for anybody who hasn't memorized it yet, is I don't remember. Somebody memorize it? What's politics? See what I did there? Some people do know. The dynamics of power, dynamics of power in social relations. OK. And now, how did I define power? Nobody got it? OK, cool. The ability to make others do what they otherwise would not. Now, I'll caveat this by saying I could, just like the way there is a more precise academic way of stating that, I didn't give you the most analytically precise definition because I didn't want to freak you out with these analytical words. I want to give it to you in a way that is easily digestible. So I said, power is the ability to make someone do what they otherwise would not do. I said others, I'm saying someone. If I was being really analytically precise, I would say entity. One entity to affect itself or another entity, but too jargonistic. So power is the ability to make someone do what they otherwise would not do, all right? Now, your question is, is it inherently political? So two social constructs, we got two identities. Your identity is Joe, my identity is D. Why can't Joe and D have a beer at the White House and why has it got to be so antagonistic? Why has it got to be so political? Can't we talk about football? Right? So here is obviously, I'm, you know, but the dynamics of power. So you said, couldn't it be, couldn't it be uh, neutral? Yeah, like any given social Let construct. Me, right, right. So couldn't a given social construct, right? We have different socially constructed identities, but couldn't the power balance between us be neutral? Right? Yes, it can be. That's what we're aiming for, right? Another way of saying that is couldn't it be equal or equitable? Could the power balance between us, the dynamics of power that flows between you and I, you have the power when you hold the mic. I have the power in the architecture of the social construct of this academic industrial complex because I'm a motherfucking professor, <laughs> right? Um, but we are taking turns with power. I'm ceding power to you. I'm shutting up when you are speaking. Right? So we have an equitable distribution of power. That doesn't make it not political. That makes it a just distribution of power in that relationship. Okay? But the funny thing is, when I put that slide up and I said power is the ability to make others do what they otherwise would not do, lots of people in here, maybe the majority, read that agreed with it or did it disagree with it or liked it or didn't like it, but read it as if that is necessarily antagonistic, that the definition of politics I gave is necessarily hierarchical, is necessarily antagonistic. But it's not, right? Even the ability to make someone else do what they otherwise would not do, right? That sounds very oppressive, right? Sounds hierarchical. Right? Sounds negative. But what if, Joe, you were not going to study you know, for your exam, and I came over and we were having a couple beers, and I convinced you maybe you should study. I, I was able to make you do what you otherwise would not do. I exercised power over you. Right? Now, our distribution of power in our dynamic of human relations, dynamic means it's always changing, right? If I'm always telling you what the fuck to do, sometimes you benefit, sometimes you don't, that's not an equitable distribution of power, right? But if we have a dynamic of power where you're benefiting from my expertise, I'm benefiting from your expertise, right? I'm, you're getting me to do things I wouldn't otherwise do, know things I wouldn't otherwise know, right? Get out of relationships I wouldn't otherwise get out of. You are empowering me by exercising that power in an equitable way. Cool? Yeah, that makes sense. 
Everybody get that? Do people agree? Are there other people who heard? Just put your hand up if it's the case. Uh, did you, when you saw those definitions, when you wrote those definitions down, hopefully you have them in your notes, did you also have that same impression that I'm saying is probably characteristic of a lot of people? Feel like the definition I gave of politics was inherently hierarchical, inherently oppressive? Hands up if you did sort of feel that way. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. So now, hopefully, it's clear that it's not. It's clear that that was an impression. But the question that raises, which I won't go into because, Dan, I don't follow every tangent. Um, the question that raises is, if you agree, and you might not, you may still you know, not be happy with the answer I gave Joe, in which case bring it up when we do discussion. But, um, but if you do agree, now that I've explained it, you're like, OK, I get it. Dynamics of power. It doesn't say imposition of power. OK, it doesn't say colonial power. OK, it's dynamics. OK, otherwise do, you know, you can exercise power on yourself. Right? Get yourself to do something you, wasn't, you weren't otherwise going to do. Lots of us have trouble exercising self-control. Right? That means we, we don't seem to have the power to do a thing that we think we, we want to do. Right? So those definitions are actually neutral. But the question that raises, which I'm not going to answer, but I'd like to know what you think, come tell me in office hours or in discussion, why is it that so many people, including maybe you, read that definition, those definitions of politics and power, as not neutral, as negative. Why, when you apply it here, and I say, OK, socially constructed identities are inherently political, and you hear that as like, yeah, that means they're inherently unjust. Right? Maybe that's at the core, right? You, you, see, that, you see that sentence. You've taken these kinds of classes, or you only took this class. And even with the definitions I gave you, you read that first sentence as, both are social constructs, therefore both are inherently unjust. Or every social construct, every socially constructed identity is inherently unjust. Right? Not what I'm saying. But why do we see it that way is an interesting question. Let's move on. Um, no, sorry. I mean these points, yeah. No. Ambiguous language, my fault. Often used interchangeably problematic, why? Because. Ethnic identities arise from different historical processes than race. Race is a, ra the modern concept of race, the way we're using race, um, has a particular genealogy. There's a particular historical context, global historical context, in which, and processes, um, and events that happened that created this term that we call race, created the meaning, right? And it's not the same. It's not coterminous with, it's not identical to the processes by which what we call ethnicities arose in history. All right? All the different ethnicities that we talk about, if we call those races, we are trans, we're not talking about colonial subjectivities reified as inherent identities. What we're talking about is the way people have people in this part of the world with their language they speak and they encountered some other people and they historically spoke this way and then they identified each other as different and the, these are different ethnicities. Right? Not the same shit. Could be, Joe, that one group of people, one ethnic group, encountered another group who didn't think of themselves as ethnically distinct until they encountered these other people who speak in a different language, uh, celebrating on a different day, uh, sacrificing a different type of animal, what the fuck ever, you know, uh, uh, playing a sport in a different way, whatever, right? Um, could be that th that's a, the, it's, it was a neutral, you know, one wasn't oppressing the other, right? Those identities are not necessarily created. They're, the identity is always created in contradistinction to another group, but it's not always created in contradistinction to the oppression and the invention of another group, right? So that's the distinction. Ethnicity, the phenomena whereby any historical polity, political group, or you know, polity, very broadly, you could say community, right? Um, whereby any historical polity differentiates itself from others. Ethnic identities long predate racial identities. All right? Ethnic identities 
have a long history. There's no part of the world in which we don't have ethnic identities. There's no time in written human history that people didn't identify themselves in certain communities as distinct from other communities. There is a historical time when people did not identify themselves racially. And that's about 500 years ago. Right? Prior to European colonialism and slavery, the concept of race as we know it today, right? not the first usage of the word in different contexts meaning different things, the way we know it today is derived from the global processes of capitalism, colonialism, and slavery. OK, next slide. Along predate racial, members of a given race belong to many different ethnicities, many different cultures. OK, here's a key point, right? Sort of obvious, but without understanding the previous stuff, you say it's obvious, but you know, having this context makes this mean something a lot more clear, I think. Members of a given race belong to many different ethnicities and many different cultures, right? Does this sound obvious? I'm going to say yes. Anybody think this is not obvious? OK, that means everybody thinks it's obvious. Now, why am I putting it on a slide if everybody thinks it's obvious, and I know everybody thinks it's obvious. Why am I putting it on a slide? Because I redefine race. Yeah, give, give it a mic. I gave a different definition of race, yeah, which is different than sort of the mainstream definition. Yeah, and I think um, everyone's idea of what culture is is probably also quite different right as well um so given that i think yeah we all think not our head agree but we're probably thinking like 140 different things Please just speak up a little bit i'm just not sure if everybody can hear you yeah mike is working yeah given our own like previous definitions that we have i think we could have like 100 different ideas of what this is actually saying right so let's just talk about the second, this second uh, sentence here. Me members of a given race belong to many different ethnicities, many different cultures. You agree? I think so. OK. Um, I think so too. But for the sake of argument, or for the sake of speaking up for some people here who are not as comfortable talking about this as you, mm -hmm. uh, tell me why you might not agree. Conjecture a possible objection. Uh, well, as far as culture, I could say that though there are many different ethnicities in my in my race, uh, yeah. we all share the same culture. Right, right, and that's why I'm saying this is obvious. Everybody, nobody put their hand up and said it's not obvious. Right? Some people are liars. Um, but other people, it's obvious because we're talking about it in this context where it makes it obvious. But if we were in one of these conversations where people are assuming a particular understanding of race, like we're you know, in a conversation about black culture. We're talking about black culture, right? Not black cultures. So if we're talking about black culture, and then somebody says, wait, 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 wait. Races, uh, people in, of one race belong to all different cultures. Well, black culture, what do you even mean by black culture, right? In that context, people will be like, what are you talking about? That's not obvious in that context. Exactly to, due to the way you initially answered the question, because it depends on how we're defining these things. And we could get into it. So in that conversation, you might have that. Maybe you've had that conversation already. But if not, any of you might be in a conversation like that, and then the, sub and then the people who you want to argue with there seem to be agreeing with you. And the people you don't want to argue with, who you expect to be on your side, seem to be arguing with you. And then you're confused why. And it's precisely for this reason, because we're making assumptions about our understandings of these words without being clear on them. Thank you. Um, next slide. Seth, do you mind hitting the next one? OK, shared ethnicities generally is a big, uh, I should put it in scare quotes, not, not necessarily. 
shared ethnicity generally includes shared culture. Racial description falsely claims racial description falsely claims to group people according to culture when in fact it groups people according to colonial relations. All right? Now, this uh, I told you, I'm going to give you these slides. This follows from KRS-1's definition, from my definition, from Kwame Torre's definition, from, the, from different things I've been showing you. It's not everybody who agrees with this. Okay? If you are understanding race as culture, the way some people understand it, right? if you think that, if you think that what defines race is different cultures, there's lots of literature that discusses it that way, then this is wrong, okay? This, what I'm putting on the slide here, and, I don't, and I'm not telling you you must believe one or the other. I'm telling you you need to understand the argument for this so you can make an informed choice about what you agree with, right? Racial ascription falsely claims to group people according to culture when in fact it groups people according to colonial relations, right? That's what KRS-1 is claiming. That's what Professor D is claiming. That's because KRS-1 is my teacher, and KRS-1's teacher is Kwame Torre, previously known as Stokely Carmichael. There's the lineage. OK? But you, it's up to you to decide if you're down with us or somebody else, or if you have you know, your own revision. To the degree that a racial group appears to have a specific culture, very, you're bang on. Like what you said is exactly where I'm going with this. To the degree that a racial group appears to have a specific culture, that shared culture is constructed post facto, meaning after the fact, post facto to the colonial relation. So when we talk about white culture, or when we talk about black culture, these are not incoherent categories. There is such a thing as black culture, right? in a particular context. But there's not one black culture irrespective of context, right? Just like there's not one anything irrespective of context, as I told you at the beginning of this class. All meaning is context dependent. But when we're talking about black culture, shared black culture, what is black culture? What is not black culture? What is white culture? Is there such a thing as white culture? That's a debate. <laughs> Y'all can read James Baldwin. If you haven't already, I recommend it. Um, but, or you could take my problem of whiteness class, uh, where we read James Baldwin. Um, so, uh, but what this means here is that I'm not claiming to you, when I said racial description falsely claims to group people according to culture, there's an easy way to read that second point there and hear that as saying, Therefore, there's no such thing as a black culture, right? Not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the coherence of the term black culture and the concept of black culture is relative to the historical, social, temporal, and geographical context in which we are talking about it, right? in which race has been invented, and then race, which is initially a colonial construct, is then being represented firstly by the colonizer as an excuse for oppressing people. Then they say, then you know, they try to turn the contingent identity, right? Contingent meaning it could have gone the other way, right? Nigerians could have showed up and colonized some Europeans. Could have happened. Contingent, historically contingent, right? We could imagine it in, a, in some kind of alternate universe, right? Um, people, uh, there are African ethnicities that eliminated other African ethnicities in history, that conquered other African ethnicities. But those particular conquests, those oppressions, are not the particular conquests and oppressions and, uh, and great historical injustices that currently define our contemporary world, all right? 
is a different set of contingent historical processes, the ones that you read in the Black Power book, right, that define our current world. But we are not taught that it is this specific history and these specific relationships of oppressed and oppressor that explain, that define these different identities that we have. What we are told is that they are inherent identities, is that it's something about how we look. It's something about how we walk and talk. Wrong. But the nuance is the way we look and the way we walk and talk and the way we self-construct, the way we invent our own identities, right? Not the way our identities are invented for us, but the culture that we create as a means of resisting the oppression that we feel, right? And this applies to everybody in the room on different levels, in different ways. The identity that you construct for yourself as an individual, in many ways, you just accept the social identity that's given to you by your parents, by society, by your school, whatever. But there's some aspects of your identity that you reject, some things that you don't like, right? And you pull from other cultural, you pull from cultural materials in order to invent your own identity. If you don't, you have no agency, you know, you're not, you haven't invented yourself, right? You're not an individual, you're a clone, right? You've got to invent yourself, you've got to define yourself. But society and your family and, you know, all your social situations are always trying to define you, right? Now, sometimes they're defining you in a way that gives you a lot of privilege, in which case you probably aren't trying to change all of that, right? But other times, it's denying you access to things you want, rights, opportunities, resources, recognition, whatever it is, right? That's when you use different cultural materials, you draw from different places to say, nah, you thought I was that, I'm this, all right? And that's the cultures that we create. To the degree that racial groups appear to have specific culture that share culture post facto. Go to the next slide. Okay, we're going to define uh, culture next class uh, because we are out of time. Let's do, uh, do you have the attendance there? Uh, just throw the attendance up on screen. We'll do attendance and then class is dismissed until Thursday.